So anyways, what is anatomy and what is physiology? Well, let's kind of break them down here. Anatomy. Oh, don't tell me this brand new pen is already, already bad. Oh, gosh. Seriously? All right, well, anyways, well, yeah, no, that's not going to work. That's not going to work. Bummer. Okay, well, it's nice knowing you. Can. See if I can make it to the trash can. Oh, that was that was slick. All right. Anyways, that was just a number of back, backup pens. All right. So anatomy is the study of structures. And one big thing we talk about is form versus function. So in, in this class, wait a second, this is mirrored. Hold on a second, I'm gonna pause this. All right, this should be better, I think. Hold on, let me look. Yeah, let me say, okay, great, great. Yeah, they updated Zoom and I guess they had to make some changes. All right, so anyways, it is the study of structures. You look at something and you say, okay, what is this? And you will be identifying it. The anatomy part of this course, we mainly stick to lab. The physiology part of this course, we mainly stick to lecture. And we will be doing some physiology labs in as, as well, but mainly with anatomy. This is the structure. Here it is. Identify it. Now, Physiology is a bit different. So physiology explains chemical and molecular processes that link systems together. For example, I might show you a kidney. However, that is the structure. Anatomy is about structure. The function of it is how it works to filter our blood and excrete waste. That is the complex part. So in this course, you're going to be challenged because learning anatomy and physiology is gonna take some time and it's going to be a time intensive process. This is a six unit class. So you will need to dedicate your time to make sure that you have enough time in order to set aside studying. It's going to be hard too because this is a self-paced class and you need to be especially disciplined. So I guess the best way to put physiology, it's about the function of things. It's how things work. The heart is made up of cardiac muscle that's made out of pericardium. That's one of the layers, it's made up of tendons, but the function of it is to be a very efficient pump and deliver blood throughout the entire body. To give you an example. Now, there's two types of anatomy. And the first one we're going to talk about is called gross anatomy. Gross anatomy. Now, what is gross anatomy? Gross anatomy is anything that you can see with the naked eye. That is gross anatomy. And we further break that up into two subcategories. So regional, so regional is all the structures in a region. For example, the heart, and the, and the lungs, they are found in a specific region of the body, in the thoracic. So that's an example of regional. The stomach and the intestines, that is regional. So regional found in one region of the body. Systematic is specific to systems. So the next one is going to be of course, these Expo pens are the expensive ones too. 
Let's see how this one works. Hey. Okay. So next we are going to have systematic. An example of systematic is going to be, for example, the, um, the, the muscular system, or it's going to be the uh, digestive system, the cardiac system. So it's all the structures that you can see with the naked eye that do a series of processes. So regional is, is a specific region. Systematic is going to be um, structures that work to work to, together to maintain a series of processes. We'll be going over the various systems throughout the semester. We also have one more subcategory, and it is going to be surface. Surface. To give you an example here, surface would be anything that you can see um, on the surface of the skin. For example, muscles. If you have good muscle tone and you flex, you can actually see your biceps muscles, triceps muscles. Uh, you can also see, for example, where the elbow joint is. So these are things that can be felt on the surface. Okay. Now next is going to be microscopic. So I'm gonna go ahead and erase this now. Hope you all have no qualms about that. I just used whiteboard cleaner on the board and it has had the opposite effect. The board is not clean, it's now streaky. All right, so next we're on to microscopic. Microscopic is different, of course. Most of this class is going to deal with macroscopic. It's going to deal with, with larger structures that we can see with the naked eye. But there is a type of uh, study called cytology, which I think I have on here yet. Cytology is the study of cells. And you can only see, okay, you, most cells you can only see under a a microscope of some sort. There's some that you don't need. For example, some neurons are a meter long. You can definitely see that with, with the naked eye. Uh, cells can be larger or smaller. For example, the cells that make up the immune system, such as leukocytes, which are white, white blood cells, or, or, or um, erythrocytes, red blood cells, those, those um, are individual cells. They don't make up larger uh, uh, structures called tissues. So with cytology, we're dealing with the cellular level only, just the cell. The next one is going to be called histology. Histology. And histology is the study of tissues. What is a tissue exactly? A tissue is a structure that's made up of cells of a similar type. For example, muscle tissue is made up of skeletal muscle cells, cardiac muscle cells. Of course, an organ is different. An organ is different types of tissues that create a functional structure. So we will be doing a, uh, we will be, be doing a lab that involves histology and cytology, looking at slides of uh, uh, different tissues or cross sections of an organ. We'll be identifying the different cells and tissues of that. Something that we're not gonna to cover too much in this class, but it is developmental anatomy. So as an organism is developing, it is going to have certain structures that are going to change over time. To give you an, an example, young, young children actually have they're born with a, what they, they call the, uh, the baby teeth. Those come in first, but on top, you have the, uh, the permanent teeth. So that's an ex example of something that's going to change throughout development. Also, as, as an organism is developing in the embryonic stage, there are certain structures that are, are, are going to be re replaced or even um, uh, altered a bit. For example, at the embryonic stage, um, humans, developing humans, actually have gills, and then they're eventually replaced with lungs. 
So developmental NAMI is something we don't really get to too much, but the textbook has lots of great information on it if you would like to read up on it. It just is not going to be tested. All right, so the next thing we're going to be talking about is complementary structure and function. Let's go ahead and get that covered. So the common theory of evolution states that at one time we were one cell and then something happened, a genetic mutation happened, and we became more and more complex life forms. So if you look now at the way that we are, that we are built, if you subscribe to the accepted view of evolution, we look the way that we, that we do because it gave us a survival advantage over those that did not have the traits. For example, why is it that we have a leg bone that is shaped um, very long, circular, and is designed to hold lots of force? That's because it was better than one that maybe was not as long Maybe what maybe did, did not have quite as large of a uh, diameter and couldn't hold as much force. We look the way that we do because it was the best way to survive and not compete our, our competition. So, so that's why it's very important to link structure and function uh, together. Something we have looks the way it does because it, it helps perform a very important job. Or maybe not important. With evolution, it's not about making something perfect, it's making something that works better than what was already there. For example, the process of developing a fever. We used to think that, that, the, that developing a fever was really essential to, to fighting uh, uh, pathogens. But it's, it's accepted now that maybe a mild fever is okay, but the body actually can develop a fever that is so intense that it can actually damage brain tissue. So that is something that is not optimal, but it works well enough most of the time. But anyways, when we see, when we see something, the way that it, that it looks um, is, is going to determine its function. Now, the example that the, the, the book uses is teeth. Let me show you some examples of teeth. So carnivores, and I'm not the best at drawing much. So, so excuse me if these teeth are not, not perfect. So if we look here at tooth one, to give you an example, we'll say it's going to look like this. So this is tooth one. Now let's go ahead and look at tooth two. Tooth two. Now these are both teeth, but why is one flat at the bottom and why is one pointed at the bottom? And the answer has to do with what its function is. Now there are certain animals, mainly, herb mainly herbivores, that grind their food. They grind their food uh, between their teeth. Therefore, if a tooth is flatter with, with ridges, it's easier to grind the food. This tooth here is very pointed. It's designed for tearing things. And this is good for something that is a carnivore that has largely a meat-based diet. Omnivores, which is what we are, we have teeth that are somewhat in, in, somewhat in between these two. So these, these teeth are designed also with a very hard outer layer called enamel. And that prevents the teeth from wearing down over time. So we see that these teeth have a very specific structure. They are, they are hard. They're covered with a hard, they're a, a, a hard coating. And we know that the function is slightly different. It is to grind food or tear food uh, in order to eventually swallow and make, make part of our of ourselves. Because really, nature is pretty savage, if you want to think about it. So what we do is that we take living things, and then we 
basically destroy them and turn them into different shapes that we call food, sometimes grotesquely, like if you're a fan of McDonald's, uh, what they do to the poor chickens is not anything that I want to dis describe. And then you are going to um, crush it into tiny bits, swallow it, it's going to be melted in your digestive system and absorbed into your blood, which if you, you think about it, it's pretty savage. Okay, well, when we come back from our break, we're going to talk about structural organization. So take a short break, stretch break, and we'll be back soon. All right, everyone, well, welcome back for part three. We're not going to talk about survival needs. And we're not going to spend an exorbitant amount of time on this. But we're going to be talking about survival needs. <clears throat> So we have to break down what does it mean to survive? What is survival? Survival is the ability to keep on living. Obviously something we're all concerned with. So what exactly do we need to survive? First thing we're going to talk about is nutrients. We need nutrients to survive. Now what are some examples of nutrients? Well, for starters, essential vitamins and minerals, especially things like sodium, which is one of the, are the most important chemical substances in our body, ions. And if you have a depletion of sodium, you're going to impact things like, like water movement and muscle movement, and of course, heart function. So we need to, to be able to have an essential amount of vitamins, minerals, salts. So we need those, those substances in our bloodstream. We also need the building blocks of organic matter, also known as macronutrients. Amino acids, which, um, are, which are derived from proteins. We're testing the fire alarm. I'm gonna pause it while it's... One, two, three, four. All right, that's end of the fire alarm testing for now. All right, so yes, yes, nutrients, the main thing we are concerned with is chemical substances, vitamins, minerals, and also macronutrients, amino acids, fatty acids, nucleic acids, and sugars. We need those in order to function. However, we need a gas, a very important gas. We need a gas called oxygen. Oxygen is an incredibly essential gas. And the reason behind that is simple. We need oxygen for what's called oxidative reactions. Making energy relies on oxygen. Do you re remember your cellular respiration pathways from biology at any level, or just in case you find that fun to learn on your own, you'll, you'll know that oxygen is essential for making lots of ATP, which gives us energy. Next is going to be water. Depending on your age, you're anywhere from 55 to 70% water. I'm not gonna draw water in blue, which would make sense, wouldn't it? But I'm gonna draw it in red. H2O is water. Two hydrogens, one oxygen. Polar substance. Now water is the most prevalent substance in our body because it is a transport medium. Things cannot disperse throughout our body through thin air. We need to be able to dissolve things in a water medium in order to be available to the rest of our body. Cells are filled with water. The vessels are filled with water. The space between cells is filled with water. So we actually have three water-filled environments in the body, intracellular, extracellular, blood. So water is the transport medium. For whatever reason, as people increase in age, their water concentration actually goes down. So young, young children actually have the highest ratio of water in their body. Next is going to be, to be temperature. A large amount 
of heat that we, we, that we produce, keep in mind that humans are mammals, we're considered endotherms. Our temperature is regulated by a series of what we call homeostatic processes. We'll talk about that later. But more or less, temperature is a product of our metabolism. All right, we're safe again. Fire alarms probably be going off quite a few times. But we'll get through it. All right, anyways, moving right along. So yes, yes, temperature. Temperature is actually regulated in the, the hypothalamus, detected by sensory receptors called thermoreceptors. But anyways, temperature is a product of our metabolism. Do you re if you remember one of the laws of thermodynamics, uh, I think it's the first law, but don't quote me on that. Energy cannot be, be, be created or destroyed. Yes, energy cannot be created or destroyed, only transferred. And also that transfer, I think that this might be the second law. Energy transfer is not 100% efficient. And whatever is not transferred is lost as heat. That heat is lost forever. That energy is lost, lost forever. That's why when you drive, if you open up your, 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 um, your engine compartment, you'll feel a lot of heat because Internal combustion engines are only about 35% efficient, meaning that the gasoline, when it's converted to energy, most of it has lost its heat. That's why the engine is so hot. With us, our temperature is a product, our internal temperature is a product of our, the heat lost through metabolism. We actually lose 50% of our, of our food to heat. So it is not transferred to usable energy. Uh, we need to, to be able to maintain a constant internal temperature because chemical reactions are catalyzed, meaning sped up, by proteins called enzymes. Enzymes make chemical reactions happen faster, and those need a stable temperature to function right. If it's too cold, enzymatic function goes down. If it's too hot, it speeds up. If it's way too hot, it cooks and it goes away forever. So temperature in the body, maintaining a constant temperature is really important. And next, and this is something we're gonna talk about quite a bit later, but next we have atmospheric pressure. Atmospheric pressure. Uh, there's gonna be something that we're going to be talking about called a gradient. We're talking lots about gradients because physiology, when we talk about it, mainly is concentration gradients. And what we want to make to make sure is that in, in the atmosphere, there's lots of oxygen. In our lungs, there's lower oxygen because it's constantly being used by our cells. So as long as you have that high gradient, yes, as, as long as you have that high gradient, oxygen can freely go from the atmosphere into our lungs. And since there's a lot of carbon dioxide inside of our lungs, not much in the atmosphere, carbon dioxide is gonna go from our lungs to the atmosphere. However, if you don't have a large gradient of oxygen, oxygen is not going to flow down your lungs fast enough and you could have oxygen deprivation. That's why when you see on those Everest documentaries, how at a certain elevation, they need supplemental oxygen is as you increase in altitude, you decrease in pressure. You, you, if you decrease in pressure, that means there's not as much oxygen available to go into your lungs. So having proper atmospheric pressure is important to get enough oxygen in your lungs and essential to getting carbon dioxide out of your lungs. Okay, everyone, we're still on fire alarm alert. So brace yourselves. All right, so now we're going to talk about the major body systems. We'll be covering these in detail throughout the semester. So I'm not, not going to go ad nauseum into any one topic. We're just going to talk about them in a larger category. So just an overview body systems. Now the first one we're going to talk about is going to be the integumentary. 
This is the first one here. Integumentary. And you're probably getting the idea here with chapter one. It's a lot of introductory stuff. Integumentary is the skin. The, uh, the epidermis, which is closest to the surface of the body. The dermis, which is just below the epidermis. Dermis is actually the living structures in it. Epidermis is technically more or less, um, most of it is dead. Then the hypodermis is all the blood, the blood vessels, lymphatic tissue, um, collagen and stuff, fat, uh, adipose, that is, is below it. The idea behind the integumentary system is mainly protective. It's supposed to separate the outside and the inside of the body. But that's not all. The integument system also produces a very important hormone called vitamin D. Now, why is it called vitamin D if it's a hormone? Someone named it that. Um, it, it has a fancier name, but we call it vitamin D. Vitamin D is an incredibly important hormone that we can only synthesize with sunlight. And if you have a darker complexion, what's going to happen is that you actually do a better job of blocking UV light. And if that, if that happens, you don't make as, as much vitamin D as somebody with lighter complexion because the, the skin, skin pigment partially filters out UV rays. So if you have darker complexion like me, you need to go outside and be exposed to more sunlight. Or you, or you can do what I do, is just take supplementary vitamin D, because I have chronically low vitamin D. Reason why I bring, bring that up is because if you don't get anything else from this lecture, you know that SARS-2 virus causing COVID-19 is wreaking havoc on our world. I'm sure I don't need to tell you that. I'm sure you already know that quite, quite well. But we know that there is a strong correlation between um, the severity of respiratory illnesses and vitamin D levels. There's been multiple studies that have linked that correlation. The higher your vitamin D, D levels, um, there's a, a correlation with the less severe the respiratory um, uh, diseases are. So make sure that you get your vitamin D, D levels checked and supplement accordingly. The integument system also contains something called sensory receptors. These detect stimuli from the outside environment in the form of tactile response. We have things like fine touch, coarse touch, um, pressure, pain, temperature. All those are, de are, are detected through the skin, through the integument. So the integument event has all those uh, functions. Next is skeletal. Skeletal system is largely for support, support and protection. It provides a solid structure that our muscles can move in order to, to explore the environment. Skeletal muscles, their function is to move bone. It also protects certain organs. For example, the heart and lungs are protected by the, the thoracic cage. It offers protection against physical trauma. Also, the skeletal system is responsible for synthesizing cells because inside of our large bones, our long bones, there's something called marrow. Marrow is responsible for synthesizing leukocytes and erythrocytes, white and red blood cells, respectively. And yes, I know I'm going over this a bit fast, but this is mainly just background info. If you want to slow down my, my, my speech, when you watch this YouTube video, you can set it to 0.75 if you want speed. Talking too slow for you, speed it up to 1.25. All right, muscular system. This is a very important system because it allows you to move your bones, closing and, and, and opening angles. And the center point is the, is the joint. And muscles allow you to explore your environment. On the other side too, what it does is it allows you to generate heat. Muscle generates heat through activity. 
Next is the nervous system. We are the nervous system. It's kind of interesting to think is really, we only have control over one part of our body. Our conscious control of our nervous system. You might think, well, wait a second, we can consciously move, move muscles. No, as we'll learn, your nervous system requests that your muscles contract and, you, and your muscles react accordingly. So yes, we have control over our muscles, but that's because our nervous system tells them to contract. So the, the, the nervous system allows the input of sensory stimuli into our brain and the output to our motor neurons, which allows us to do um, movement and also our, our, uh, uh, the, autom uh, the autom automatic systems too. So the nervous system is the general control and processing center of the body. Next is endocrine. Endocrine hormones, a hormone is something that is secreted into the blood. We have some odd 70 trillion cells that are connected, intertwined with the, 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 the bloodstream. What that does is it allows endocrine hormones which are secreted by a gland called the, the pituitary gland, and also some other um, uh, um, organs in our, in our body. But these hormones are secreted into the bloodstream and have a wide range of effects on cells. These effects are usually long, long lasting, some of them permanent. Examples of endocrine hormones is going to be testosterone, estrogen, cortisol, thyroid hormone, so on and so forth. Cardiovascular involves the heart and the blood vessels. As I was talking about, blood needs to circulate throughout our body because it delivers nutrients and essential gases and moves waste products out for all 60 to 70 trillion cells in our, in our body. The heart is the pump. The heart is just responsible for moving blood. The blood is the important substance that nourishes the cells. The cardiovascular system is the heart and all of the blood vessels in the body. It's a closed loop. It always bothers me in Hollywood movies, like when someone's really hurt, shows them um, coughing up blood. That, that, that doesn't happen. Blood stays in the, the vessels, or if you're seriously injured, goes into your body cavities. The only way you'll be coughing up blood is if you have a injury to the, to the lungs or some kind of growth that's damaging your lung, your lung tissue. You don't start to cough up blood because you're really hurt. But I guess in Hollywood, the way they show that someone's really hurt is like having them cough up blood. Oh, that person's coughing up blood. He must be really messed up. Pet peeve of mine. One of the many pet peeves that I have. Okay, enough about me. Next is going to be the lymphatic system. The lymphatic system is interesting. Uh, one thing we'll learn about is that our, our capillaries, our, our leakier blood vessels, are constantly pushing out water into the extracellular space, excess water the lymphatic system returns this excess water to the, to, the, uh, um, to the blood. That way it doesn't just pool in our, in our, uh, our body cavities causing tissue or, or body swelling, edema. Uh, the lymphatic system also contains nodes. That's the, that's the major site of the leukocytes or white blood cells. Uh, the lymphatic system is also res responsible for transporting fats when, we, we, when we, we, we eat them. It doesn't go right into the blood. It goes, goes through the lymphatic uh, tissue first, lymphatic system. All right, next is digestive. And by digestive is important because it allows us to take food and break it down to, to, a, to a usable or to a it's simple as building blocks so our cells can use it. Our cells can only use 
macronutrients, uh, which are the things that uh, create life, our cells can only use them if they're broken down into their smallest possible units. The digestive system does that. It takes our food stuff and breaks it down to the smallest possible units. We call them monomers. We'll be learning about that later this semester. Urinary it has multiple functions. Urinary uh, system is actually one of my favorites. It's very important. What it does is it, is it ex excretes excess water, excess salts, and wastes. And it does that by through the process of excretion. So what it does is it regulates a lot of systems in your body just to, to, just to keep things simple. What it does is it, is it, uh, it, 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 um, it regulates water and eliminates wastes. We'll just go with that. Keep things simple. And lastly, the reproductive system creates offspring. Reproductive, it creates offspring. Now we are not asexual beings, we are sexual beings, meaning that you need a male and a female. You need the two gonads, verminate to, to connect. And then you are going to hopefully be in the process of creating new offspring. So that's the job of the re reproductive system. Uh, the reproductive system is arguably the only one you can um, be without and still survive. Interesting fact. All right, so this is the end of part two, or part three. Thank you for bearing with me on the fire alarm. Probably created a little bit of excitement. So yeah, see you all for part four. All right, everyone, well, welcome back. We're now on to structural organization. And the first part of structural, or structural organization going to put down here, structural organization. Now we're still trying to understand the fabric of space and all that good stuff. But basically, we are all made or we all begin from what we call the chemical level, the atomic level. What this is, is that we are made up of certain atoms. We are carbon-based life forms, meaning that carbon is the dominant atom, the dominant element that makes up us. Not just carbon though, nitrogen, oxygen, calcium, sodium, potassium, magnesium, lots of others, but we rely on the chemical level for survival. Now, the chemical level is not life. It is not living. The smallest unit of life is actually called the cell. We are made up of 60 billion cells that comprise us. Everything that we are is a bunch of cells that work together to create a functional organism. It's a very impressive job of our body. These, these cells constantly need nutrients. They constantly need to get rid of waste products. And we have a very efficient system that can give every cell in our body that's, that needs it, glucose for energy and oxygen for energy. And that's happening constantly. So our body is amazing at giving our cells everything that they need. If you deprive a cell from oxygen and glucose for too long, it does not function well. The neurons in your brain do not function well at all without oxygen or, or, uh, or, or glucose. It just basically turns off. So the cellular level, we are made up of cells. Now the next part is going to be the tissue level. What a tissue is, a tissue is multiple cells of the same type that form some sort of structure. 
So the, the, the tissue level, once again, cells of the same type that are bound together that form a, a structure. So you may not be able to see one cell, but if you have a bunch of cells of the same type anchored together, you'll see a tissue. The easiest one to describe is muscle tissue. Okay, another example would be tissue of the liver, uh, adipose tissue, which are our fat tissue, um, or fat. So, so it's anything that is multiple cells of the same type. Now next is the organ. The organ level. Now organs are functional structures made up of multiple types of tissues. Multiple types of tissues is going to create an organ. For example, the heart is an organ. It contains many types of tissue. For example, it contains collagen. It contains cardiac muscle. It contains um, um, uh, uh, kind of kind of blanking, but it contains uh, contains elastic tissue. It contains epithelial tissue. So all these 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 different tissues uh, uh, together create an organ that does a job. In this case, the organ is going to act as a pump. And, and it, like it's even made up of cells that can conduct electricity too, called pacemaker cells. So it's lots of different types of tissues. The integument, the skin, also contains many different types of uh, tissues, many different layers of tissues. For example, it contains adipose tissue, it contains, contains epithelial cells, it contains um, melanin producing um, cells. It contains uh, um, uh, um, tendons, lots of things. So after the organ level is going to be the organ system. Let's go ahead and kind of go up here. Organ systems are things that work together in order to fulfill a certain function. So they, they work together for, a, for a, a larger goal. For example, the muscle system that is designed to move the body, move the organism, and explore the surroundings. It's also essential for things like, like getting food, survival. The integument system, for example, is designed to cool off the body through sweating, is designed to, to, to cushion the body, the adipose tissue that's, uh, uh, that's attached to it, the hypodermal layer. It's designed to form an imp impenetrable layer that keeps dirt, debris, and pathogens from, from getting into the more sensitive parts of the body. It's designed to feel, um, to uh, get sensory information from the environment through mechanical touch or chemical stimuli. So that is an, so those are examples of organ systems and the book has more about that. So organ systems is basically multiple organs that work together to form a common goal. And last of all is going to be the organism, the life form. So an organism ideally is made up of multiple different types of organ systems. There are some organisms though that do not have a multitude of organ systems, um, but the organism is the functional part, the living thing. Cells such as um, single celled life forms, they can also be considered organisms, even though they're not made up of organ systems. But this is the largest level of organization. It's the part, it's the thing that lives, if that makes sense. Okay. So now we're going to move on to requirements for life. Obviously, it's very important that we can fulfill these requirements and well live. We're going to do now requirements for life.
boards are racing a little bit at this time. All right, requirements for life. What do we need in order to live? Requirements for life. All right, the first thing that is arguably the most important is going to be, well, not, not most important, but it's, it's important. The first one is going to be maintaining boundaries. Maintaining boundaries. Now, why is this important? Well, our body is made up of very complex structures. These structures are constantly bathed in water. And these structures are very sensitive. We don't get a good look at the inside of our body, but there's a lot of things going on. Outside of our body, what we see that we call skin is actually non-living. What we see as skin is actually cells that have been killed off and filled with a tough protein called keratin. These, these cells that make up the tissue, they're closely anchored uh, together. That creates basically an impermeable barrier that separates the outside environment from the inside environment. The outside environment is very harsh to the inside environment. You know that if you, you, you get a cut, they suggest things like washing the wound and putting on a Band-Aid. And that's because the outside environment has lots of things that want to get into your body and damage it, mainly pathogens, viruses, and bacteria. We are bacteria swimming pools. We are literally covered in bacteria. Yet inside of our bodies, unless you're currently dealing with an infection, inside of our bodies are completely sterile. If we did not have this ability or, or if we have a wound, what's going to happen is bacteria and other pathogens are going to get into our body and you are going to get infection. That's why hospitals, which go out of their way to create as, as sterile of an environment as they can, that's why after surgeries, infection is so, so prevalent because the moment you break that barrier, the moment you are, are going to have things from the outside environment enter the body. It's very hard to, to prevent. Okay, next is movement. Movement is a really, uh, it's something in our, in our lives that we cherish, of course, because if you can move, you can explore the environment. Movement is grace and beauty. For example, if you're a fan of dance, dance is movement in an artistic form. If you like sports, I'm happy sports are back, but you're seeing, you're seeing movement that creates excitement, that creates competition between, between uh, two teams, to, to put it mildly. So movement allows us to explore the environment through something called a muscle contraction. What happens is that we have muscle fibers that make up muscle tissue, and they have an ability to do one thing and one thing well, they shorten. When they shorten, it closes the angles between two, two bones. With muscles, you have an origin where it starts, and you have an insertion where it finishes. All it does is it moves bones. It closes and creates angles. It allows us to explore our environment. Next is going to be digestion. Actually, wait, responsiveness. Uh, this is also something that is essential. We need to be able to respond to the environment. Responsiveness. I hope I spelled this right. Responsiveness. We need to be able to respond to the environment. Right now, you are seeing me talk at you. And what's happening is that you are taking the words and the the, the visuals on the board, you are using that in order to respond by taking notes. You're responding to the environment. If it's cold outside, you respond by putting on a jacket. If you feel pain, you respond by making yourself not feel pain. So 
when we res respond, what happens is that sensory cells, sensory neurons that we'll talk about in subsequent chapters, for example, mechanoreceptors that detect touch, thermoreceptors that, de that, de that detect temperature, photoreceptors that, that detect visual stimuli, they're going to feed into our brain and we are, are going to respond appropriately. Some of it is automatic, meaning that we can't control it, and others is conscious, which we can decide to, um, to respond accordingly. If you want to do, do something interesting, you can, press your, your, you can press your finger on a desk, press down a tiny bit. You'll feel pressure. When you, you feel pressure, you can decide how to react. If you press down harder, you will feel, feel um, uh, pressure again. And that has to do with the way that some of our neurons work. Some of them are phasic, meaning they either turn on or off depending on the stimuli. So those are things our sensory neurons allow us to respond to the environment. They take information from the outside environment. They feed it to our brain. We interpret it either automatically or consciously, and then we respond accordingly. We do something, either changing our behavior or, um, or ignoring it or something. Next is digestion. Digestion. In the embryonic stage, the digestive tract is the first thing that forms. And there's a very good, good, uh, good reason why. Is because we are constantly growing and repairing. We do that by by creating new cells or replacing existing cells. Now, where do we get the materials to do that? The stuff that we eat. It's especially children and teenagers. They're in a constant state of making new cells. Because of that, they need lots of ingredients to make new cells. They have voracious appetites, but they, but they use that energy to build themselves and, and uh, create new cells and grow into adulthood. Adults, we don't have that luxury. Uh, we only re repair ourselves. And if we have too much energy, we grow, but not the way that teenagers and children do. We grow sideways. They grow vertically. So where do we get the in ingredients for making cells? Well, we need to consume other organic life forms. Where do we get those organic life forms? Plants, animals, insects, if that's your thing. We need to somehow find a way to melt them down into their basic building blocks. Sugar, fatty acids, amino acids, nucleic acids. When we can break them down into their simplest parts, we can absorb them into our blood. Our blood reaches every cell in our body and it's going to deliver nutrients. So the, the, the digestive system is responsible for taking our foodstuffs and breaking it down to its simplest components through a series of enzymatic reactions and making our nutrients accessible to our cells. Digestive tract is very important. Because without food, we cannot survive. All right, next is going to be mm, metabolism. Uh, we talk about metabolism in terms of weight. For example, I have a slow metabolism. I have a fast metabolism. Doesn't exist. Our, our metabolisms are basically preset. There is some variance, but not much. When we use the term metabolism, we really refer to um, whether or not we can eat a lot and not gain weight. Really, it has more to do with how efficient your metabolism is. Some people lose lots uh, um, uh, when, they, when they metabolize food. Some of them lose lots of it as heat. Some of it lose less as heat, meaning they're more efficient. The more efficient your, um, your, your metabolism is, then the less food you waste as heat and the more food you store as 
you, you store. If your metabolism is very inefficient, then what's going to happen is that you are going to lose more of your, your precious food stuff as heat as you convert it. And, be, be, and because of that, you need to eat a little bit more. Um, technically, if you do have a slow metabolism, it's actually better because you're more famine resistant. But in today's, in today's society, that means you just can't eat as much pizza. All right, an example of metabolism would be the process of cellular respiration. You do complex chemical reactions. Many of you that have learned cellular respiration, glycolysis, citric acid cycle, oxidative phosphorylation. You know that we use several chemical processes in order to eventually convert glucose into adenosine triphosphate. It is a series of complex reactions. Metabolism is chemical processes that happen in the cell in order to sustain life. There are many examples that we'll be going over throughout the semester. Next is going to be excretion. One of the classes I teach is environmental science. And one thing we talk about is just how wasteful humans are. We're constantly throwing things outside to go into the trash can. Well, the body is no different really. So, we also need to be able to excrete waste. Our cells are constantly sec um, secreting into the blood. They're constantly throwing into the blood waste products. These are things that the cell cannot use for any kind of useful purpose. In fact, it can become toxic if it builds up to large quantities. Therefore, it dumps it into the blood it's eventually filtered by the renal system and is excreted through urine. You also have solid waste, the process of uh, defecation, similar as anything that is solid that we need to, to eliminate comes out as poo or excrement, whatever you want to use. So it's important that all living things must excrete waste products into the outside environment. Don't fret because our solid waste is actually food for bacteria, fungi, and other small uh, microscopic organisms. Fun fact, soil is actually a mixture of ground up rock basically and decomposing life forms. Yes. Uh, next, we need to be able to reproduce process of reproduction, meaning we, meaning we must be able to create life forms that are similar to us. Reproduction. Unfortunately, biological life forms have a finite existence. Eventually, we are going to move on to who knows what. If we want our species, if we want life on Earth to exist, we must have a way to reproduce. Any living life form out there is capable of some sort of reproduction. There are some exceptions. Mules. Donkeys and horses are technically two different species, but they're similar enough. Um, not that much time has gone by since they were a common animal, but they actually, this common animal diverged into a horse and a donkey, but it hasn't been that, that long. So they're two separate species, but they can still reproduce and make an animal that we call a mule. All mules are, are sterile, meaning they aren't able to have children. So yeah, there's always some exceptions. If we didn't keep on mating donkeys and horses, we would not have mules any, um, anymore. Bacteria reproduce through a process called binary fission. Every 20 to 25 minutes, they split into two. So you can see how they can grow exponentially and you can have a really nasty infection in no time flat. And rounding off our list is going to be growth. Growth is an increase in the overall number of cells. When children grow, they are creating new cells. When you add cells, you grow. Now we also can take old cells and recycle them and, re re and replace them with new cells. 
in the digestive tract, the enterocytes that, that line the small intestines, about every seen days, they undergo apoptosis program cell death, and they're replaced with new cells. Doesn't matter how healthy those cells are or, or, or how well they function, they have a lifespan of seven days, and then they're, re they're replaced. The reason why is that this is so essential to survival that the body doesn't even want to risk having cells that cannot work optimally. All right, so, so to recap, these are the requirements for life. Must maintain boundaries as in a clear separation between the outside environment and the inside environment. Movement, which allows us to use skeletal muscles to explore the environment. Responsiveness. Hello, this is Jake. Uh, to anybody on campus, if you have any questions about today or troubleshooting, and most importantly, we're uploading videos for international students. At 12.30, we're going to be in stand room, room 104. Uh, so if you have any questions about Zoom or any questions about uploading international students or new account, please come to room 104 at 12.30 or check your email if you would rather attend from Zoom. I sent a link. Thanks. That's my man, uh, Jake the Snake, also known as Mr. Cousineau. He's my good friend here on campus. He was doing the announcements. There's only, there's very few males at my, my high school arena. And there's even less that are under the age of 40. Mr. Cousineau and I are basically the only two guys here in our 30s. So, yeah, you, you, you find your own kinds, right? All right, next we have responsiveness. We are going to, to detect external stimuli through a series of sensory organs or, or sensory neurons. It's going to be fed to our brain and we're going to respond with our muscles accordingly. Digestion, we must be able to take food stuff, break it down into its simplest parts so it's accessible to ourselves. Metabolism, must be able to do, do chemical processes in order to Function. Ex excretion, anything that our body cannot use or recycle or could become toxic must be eliminated from the body. Reproduction, we must be able to create new life forms similar to us. In growth, we must be able to increase the, 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 the number of cells in our body to become a mature organism. And that is all for part two. See you all for part three. All right, everyone. Well, welcome back. After an exciting day of watching me teach in my classroom that's empty with fire alarms going off, we're not going to have a little bit more simpler, less, dr less dramatic lecture to finish our chapter one. And we're going to be talking about homeostasis. Let's go ahead and get this whiteboard. Here we go, virtual whiteboard. Always a good time. It's like, it's like the most environmentally friendly whiteboard you'll see. You don't have to use, you don't have to waste uh, ink with markers or the waste that they generate. Same with erasers. You don't have to use hazardous chemicals to clean the board. And maybe hazardous is a little bit of a stretch, but they are chemicals. All right, that's enough waxing poetic. So now we're going to talk about one of the most essential things in not only biology, but also in physiology. And that is a concept of homeostasis. Homeostasis. And forgive me, my handwriting is, uh, has seen better days. <clears throat> Actually, it's never seen better days, but oh well. So homeostasis, I guess <clears throat> the definition that I like to use the most here is, is um, processes, Excuse me. Processes to return a variable to a set point. Actually, I just dis described negative feedback. So let me uh, let me erase this. I'm sorry, I kind of mixed up these terms here. So I'm going to write here. I'm going to write negative feedback. All right, now that I've jumped ahead a bit, 
Now let's go over to homeostasis. So homeostasis, best, best definition here is, um, is the process of maintaining a set value. So, so homeostasis is the act of staying the same. But the body has, has to work for it. Homeo means same. Stasis means to not change, so pretty much means same state of body. But the body has to work for it. It has to constantly change a system called a, a feedback cycle in order to main, maintain a set point. There's two types of feedback cycles we'll talk about. Negative feedback, which is the process to return a variable to a set point, and positive feedback, This is the process of moving a variable further from a set point. And positive feedback cycles in, um, in, in biology, they're not very common. And because it's basically a value grows exponentially until it just stops. But we'll go over some examples. So moving a variable further from a set point. So, so homeostasis is the process of maintaining a set value. There's many, many examples. If you get lab work, you'll see that you have a normal reference range. That is the uh, body's homeostatic levels. Temperature is, a, is an example of homeostasis. And negative feedback, the definition that I like is a process to return a variable to a set point, either by increasing something or decreasing something. So let's go ahead and let's go over um, the example that the book uses. Can't say I'm the biggest fan of it. Let's go ahead. So we're just going to say that this is going to be a variable. So this is going to be the set value. Now, if this, this, this variable changes, let's say that it is going to increase away from the set point, then something is going to have to change to get it back to this normal level. So for example, if our, our variable is going to be body temperature, uh, let me go ahead and undo all of this. So if our variable is going to be body temperature, we'll say that a normal value using Fahrenheit is going to be 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit. It could go down or it could go up. Well, let's just go ahead and say that body temperature goes up. Well, you have to ask yourself is what is going to measure, what is going to sense the fact that body temperature has gone up. Well, we are going to call this the, uh, the, the receptor. I use different terms when I teach this class and also physiology. Receptor. The receptor is a sensor. It detects things, but it does not interpret things. It detects, but does not interpret. For example, a thermometer is an example of a receptor. It doesn't tell you anything about the temperature. It just gives you a value. It's your job to interpret it. Okay, I'm not talking about the fancy thermometers nowadays, the ones that connect to your iPhone. I'm talking about like the ones you buy, you bought in the 90s. You were able to buy things in the 90s. So in this case, the receptor is going to be something called a thermal receptor. It is a type of sensory receptor that detects changes in temperature. And 
the receptor is going to send information to the control center. In this case, the control center is actually going to be the brain. Actually, not specifically the brain. It's going to be a part of the brain called the hypothalamus. So the hypothalamus is not only going to receive the signal, but it is going to determine how to adjust the system to get back to the set point. This pathway where a sensory receptor connects with the control center, we call this an afferent pathway. Afferent is when a sensory receptor connects to the control center. Don't worry, we'll be talking about this much more later on. So in this case, the hypothalamus, and this is a very simple arc. When we, if we get to the endocrine system, it will change quite a bit. This is just to show you a basic reflex arc. So now what's, what's going to happen is that the control center is going to send a signal to what is called the effector. And the effector is the thing that is going to bring about change. It is, it is what's actually going to return the variable back to its set point. And in this case, the effector is going to be muscle. Um, actually, wait, we, we did an increase in body temperature. I'm sorry. The effector is going to be sweat glands. What sweat glands do is the, the, the sweat glands are constantly closed due to muscle con constriction. And when you sweat, the muscle actually relaxes, allows the pores to open, and then plasma from your blood basically goes to the, the surface of your skin to cool you off. And then we are going to have a return to set point. This pathway here, where the control center um, um, uh, sends a, a signal that leaves the brain or leaves the control center, we call this the efferent pathway. Usually what happens with the efferent pathway is you are, are going to have a change in muscle movement. Either you consciously move your muscles or you, un or you unconsciously move your, your muscles. Through, through, through the autonomic pathway. For example, and I'm just going on a simple example. Let's say that you're super hungry. You smell, I don't know, Wood Ranch barbecue and the sensory receptor is going to be um, your, uh, your photoreceptor seeing, seeing Wood, Wood Ranch, uh, your olfactory receptors smelling the yummy barbecue. But those are just that's the sensory input that is fed to your control center and your brain is going to make sense of it. So the afferent pathway is where sensory receptors, things that detect senses, feed back to the brain. Now your brain has to decide what to do with that. But what it's going to do is it's going to start to in increase the activity of your digestive system, the muscles in your digestive system to prepare for food and you might consciously decide to move to Wood Ranch and buy food. So the afferent pathway normally controls muscles of some sort, and the afferent pathway is going to give in information to the control center. In this case here, the process of sweating is going to decrease temperature and return it back to this value here. And what's gonna happen if we have the opposite? Well, it's going to be very similar. So let's say now that the temperature is too low, it's going to be very similar. Instead, what's, what's going to happen is that when the control center receives that, that the, the body temperature is dropping, instead, it is going to stimulate muscle movement, muscle contraction. This is in the form of shivering. Shivering generates heat by, by using muscle energy. So once again, the, the, the variable is the factor we are measuring, in this case, temperature. What, what senses changes in temperature is called a thermal receptor that is located in your integumentary system. 
it's a sensory receptor that has the specific job of detecting changes in temperature. Now, when the sensory receptor sends information to the control center, it does so through the afferent pathway. It's going to be received by the hypothalamus, which is going to make sense of it. And then it's going to act on what is called an effector. The effector is what's going to bring about the change to return the variable to homeostasis. We call the pathway from the control center to the effector the efferent pathway. What this is going to do is if body temperature is too low, then the process of shivering will bring it back up. And the response is going to be the return to, um, to baseline. There are many examples of this pathway. This pathway is more or less what we call a negative feedback pathway. There are so many examples. We're not, this is just basically um, an introductory chapter. So that's all you need to know now for, for this one here is just the, the different factors that control a feedback cycle. Now we also have something called a positive feedback cycle. An example of a positive feedback is going to be global warming. And that's because carbon dioxide in the atmosphere causes increased global temperatures. Carbon dioxide is stored in, in uh, ice. It's actually stored in, uh, in, largely stored in glaciers and frozen soil called permafrost. The more the temperature heats up, the more the ice melts. The more the ice melts, the, the faster global warming occurs. The hotter the, the, the temperatures, the more the ice melts, the more carbon dioxide. So it's a positive feedback cycle because it keeps going away from a set point. Examples of, so what a positive feedback cycle is, variable changes in one direction exponentially I think I spelled that wrong exponentially until it stops an example of this is going to be platelet formation So platelets actually are very, very active cellular fragments because they can actually send signals to other cells to change their behavior. Something we'll talk about when we get to the process of atherosclerosis. So this is going to be a blood, blood vessel. So these are made up of cells called simple squamous cells as we'll learn about. And let's say that this, this vessel is going to be damaged. I'm just gonna put a, the show damage. So now there's a gaping hole. Due to damage, you cut yourself on some paper. And now you are actually doing something called bleeding. So what's gonna happen here is that platelets are, are going to sense this, this defect. So the, so the platelets going, going to detect the damage going to send out signals. Okay, it's going to call another platelet. And that platelet is going to call up uh, or, or send out signals. Then it's going to call over a, another platelet. And that platelet is going to send out signals. Now, what these signals are doing is they're, is they're re recruiting more, more platelets. So, so the more, more platelets attach, the more will be called over because now all of them are secreting signals and now platelets are going to start to aggregate in very large numbers because there's so many signals being generated. Platelets are, are, are joining to seal the, the defect faster and faster. Then once the defect is sealed, the process stops. No more platelets, no more platelets will aggregate. So a positive feedback cycle, a value keeps on changing from the set point until it stops. 
All right. Well, that is the end of our chapter one lecture. I hope you all enjoyed this lecture. Um, now, what, what my suggestion to you is, is that maybe you consider doing one of the visual body labs, especially the one on the, ana on the anatomical positions. Uh, it's the scavenger hunt. That's a very good one to teach you a factor of anatomy called uh, body position and planes. You also have the chapter two one, chapter two lecture to get there as well. All right. Well, everyone, hope you enjoyed the first lecture. See you soon.